بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This is our first session inshallah azza wa jal and hope it's not the last that we begin to study one of the book which was published by the Fiqh um, Academy. Um, let me get the proper Islamic Fiqh Academy. And it is a concise yet hopefully um, beneficial summary of the Islamic Fiqh. Now, this Islamic Fiqh is a very useful platform for a student of knowledge to enroll in. One of the biggest advantages is that it's free. So when it is free, it means that you don't have to worry about paying in order to gain. Rather, it's not only free, it is also interactive. They have like 16 levels for students and each level has a number of tests that you can enroll in and test your knowledge and how much you have gained and rectify the misconceptions or the mistakes that you have and they have also badges they have um, uh, prizes they have so many things that inshallah people would benefit of uh, with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. This, um, hopefully, platform would be shared also by our Q&A uh, page, which is Sheikh Asim al-Hakim uh, community, the, 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 the page that has all these um, questions and answers. And inshallah, it should be also uh, uh, increasing the outreach for uh, the people. I'm hoping that this would be posted any minute now uh, on it bi in the Azza Wajal. The book, I hope that the administrators would be providing you with a copy of it, online soft copy, and at the same time, each session you will be given the portion that we are supposed to study. Today's portion is about the pillars of Islam. Now one would say, okay, what does studying the pillar of Islam has to do with studying fiqh? Well, first of all, issues related to aqidah are considered to be the major and utmost important part of fiqh. Because what good fiqh is without aqidah. And not only that, it is the definition of Islam. When the Prophet والسلام, in the hadith of Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, when Jibreel, peace be upon him, asked him, what is Islam? The Prophet gave the five pillars of Islam. So in order to study fiqh, Scholars divided fiqh into chapters. So sections related to forms of worship, such as salat, zakat, fasting, hajj, and everything related to it. So for example, salat, in order to pray, you have to perform wudu. Before performing wudu, you have to Purify yourself if there are any impurities due to answering the call of nature or due to ritual impurity resulting from janaba or from menses. So all of these things are mentioned before Salat. After Salat, after Siyam, after Zakat, after Hajj, there are the chapters or the sections related to transactions. And with transactions, we have things that deal with selling and buying because if you want to live, you have to eat, you have to drink, 
So you need to know what to buy and what not to buy. You need to know how to farm, how to rent, how to mortgage, how to, all of these things are included in the section of transactions. Usually, after your stomach is filled and your needs are fulfilled, you look for what is more essential, what part of, which is essential after eating and drinking, which is marriage. So they talk about marriage, divorce, they talk about khul, they talk about um, uh, maintenance uh, before uh, divorce and after divorce. They talk about custody of the children, they talk about guardians, they talk about so many, many things. Now, after all of that, usually when your stomach is filled and you have gotten married, usually dispute takes place. And this is when fights, maybe murder, maybe stealing, because you want things that others possess. So they made a section about uh, prescribed punishments in Islam. Then it moves on to talk about jihad, in spreading the religion and the things related to it. They also speak about the section uh, um, specifically about apostasy and leaving Islam, etc. So all of this is mentioned and classified in the books of fiqh that a student of knowledge usually um, is keen to learn about. Now, having said that, we move on to the first chapter of the book, which says that there are, in the beginning, the five pillars of Islam. The five pillars of Islam are very well known to us all. Yet, I think that uh, we will uh, just try and briefly go through it because there's no point in detailing it because one of the pillars to talk in detail about would take us a couple of hours at least. So we'll just skim over it quickly so that next time we meet we speak inshallah in more detail about these uh, pillars of forms of worship. The most important pillar of all is the declaration. The shahada is to testify and believe that there is no God worthy of being worshipped except Allah Azza wa Jal. And that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is his servant and messenger. So you are not considered a Muslim until you testify. And this is something that a lot of the reverts fail to pay attention to. A lot of the reverts are under pressure, living in, uh, with their Kafir family, and they're afraid of what measures they might take to reprimand them for such an act. So they don't declare Islam. Now, between you and Allah, you can be a Muslim. But between you and the other Muslim communities, you're still a Kafir. If we fail to hear you declare La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, then we cannot accept you as a Muslim. Which means that in this dunya, if you were to die, you w are not to be treated as a Muslim. You will not be washed, shrouded, prayed upon, and buried among the Muslims in Muslim cemeteries. So it is important. If someone comes to you and says, Sheikh, I'm a Muslim, I believe, but I don't want to say the Shahada, this is a blatant kafir and it is not accepted of him. So what is the shahada? The first part of it is a negation 
and a confirmation. When I say La ilah, this is what the atheists say, there's no God. Yeah, but we don't stop here. We say La ilaha illallah. And this beautiful statement, if you notice, does not require the movement of your mouth in a sense that you can say it without moving your lips. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. And it comes so easy. It is half negation, half confirmation. There is no God. And we add from our own interpretation, worthy of being worshipped. Because if we say that there is no God except Allah, Buddhists would come and say, well, we have Buddha. Hindus would come and say, we have gods. We have uh, Hare Krishna, uh, Ram, well, I don't know, Krishna maybe. I don't know what, who their gods are. And everybody would present their gods and say, your statement is wrong. There is no God. Yes, there are so many gods. Yet, we say that they are false gods. And this is why we always say, there is no God worthy of being worshipped. So this is the negation. Except Allah, this is a confirmation. So we limit worshipping only to Allah Azza wa Jal. It's like when we say in the Fatiha, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدْ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ Only you we worship. And only you, O oh Allah, we seek guidance and we seek help and if you look at the different numerous verses of the Quran you find it all revolving on the oneness of Allah Azza wa Jal and when we so talk about the oneness of Allah we mean Tawheed. And Tawheed is a big, big topic. It's not something that you just say, okay, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu Muhammad Rasulullah, boom, you become a righteous person. No, you have to believe, you have to have the conviction. As there are three types of Tawheed. The first type is Tawheed al Rububiyyah. The Tawheed of Lordship. To believe that Allah is the provider, the creator of the heavens and the earth and everything that is in them. That He is the giver of life and the taker of it. So He's the one who gives life and death. To believe that Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who makes rainfall and gives life to everything that is living and facilitates things for all beings. Now this part of Tawheed, Tawheed of Lordship, was shared by all people, even the idol worshippers. If you ask them who created the heavens and earth, they say Allah. Who brings the rain down? Says Allah. Who answers when you call? They would say Allah. Everything you ask them, they would say Allah. So there is no dispute. Only a minute portion of the disbelievers reject the concept of Allah. And they are not even 0 0.00001%. The vast majority of people, even those who said that we're not religious, we're not practicing, they believe in the existence of Allah and in the powers of Allah, the Almighty. Now, this is in the Tawheed of Lordship. The second part of Tawheed is the most important part, which is the Tawheed of Worship. This is what all the messengers were sent to do and to declare. 
And this is where the dispute between the messengers and their people, this is where the dispute arised from. That there is no deity other than Allah, it means that you have to devote all forms of worship to Allah Azza wa Jal. Because if you acknowledge that Allah is the provider, Allah is the creator, Allah is this, Allah is that, Subhanahu Azza wa Jal, MashaAllah, you believe in the Lordship of Allah, that He is the Rabb, He is the Khaliq, the creator, Al Muhi Wal Mumid, He is the Mudabbir, the facilitator. All of this is great. But if you worship other than Allah through prayer, through sacrifice to other than Allah, through seeking refuge, through supplicating, all of these are forms of worship. In this case, you become a mushrik because your tawheed was not pure, was not real. The third type of Tawheed is the Tawheed of Al-Asma wa Sifat, the beautiful names and attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is also a big uh, uh, way uh, and to talk about it is to believe in Allah's beautiful names without misunderstanding, without diverting the meaning, without simulating so you have to believe that Allah is unlike anything else and that he is all hearing, all seeing, as Allah mentioned about himself in the Quran. When we move to the second part of the declaration of the Shahada, which is وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ That I bear witness that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is Allah's servant and messenger. What does this entail? This means that you acknowledge that the Prophet والسلام, is to be obeyed in all what he commands and that he is to be believed in whatever he states and that you should refrain from whatever he prohibits and you do not worship Allah except by what he has shown us. In Arabic it rhymes beautifully. تصديقه فيما أخبر طاعته فيما أمر اجتناب ما عنه نهى وزجر وأن لا يعبد الله إلا بما شرع This is an essential part of how sincere and true you are in your declaration. When the Prophet والسلام, says something, if you say, I believe it, but I would not obey it, then you're not a true believer. If you say, I will do what the Prophet says, but I will not believe in it, but I will do it because I'm afraid of punishment. Again, this is hypocrisy. If you obey him and you refrain from what he has prohibited and you believe what he says, but you worship Allah in different ways than what he had taught us, meaning you innovate. In this case, your declaration is not authentic. So, the Prophet والسلام, part of believing that he is the servant and messenger of Allah, you must believe that he was sent to all mankind, to all humans, and that he was also sent to the jinn. And not only that, you have to believe that he is the seal of the prophethood which means that there is no prophet nor messenger after him. So Qadianis, Ahmadis, those Baha'is, those who believe that there is a messenger or a prophet after him, 
they are not considered to be among the Muslims. And also, you have to, part of believing in the Prophet والسلام, you have to honor his sunnah. You have to embrace it. You have to implement it in your life in terms of belief, action, and implementation. So part of believing in the Prophet ﷺ is to declare this belief verbally. So you have to say, yes, I believe that the Prophet is the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You have to implement this truth in your life. You have to believe in whatever he stated. So if he stated to you that there is great tribes of Ya'juj and Ma'juj and they will come at the end of the time as mentioned in Surah Al-Kahf and there they, that there is a barrier between us and them. This is something that you cannot just come and shrug your shoulders and say this is not logical. This is part of your belief to the Prophet والسلام, to humiliate yourself in front of his sunnah and to humble yourself in front of his teachings. You must love him alayhi salatu wasalam more than you love yourself, your wife, your spouse, your children, your parents, and all mankind, and all your wealth. And this love is not a natural love, rather it is an Islamic love. So the natural love is that you love your children. The Islamic love is when you are giving the choice between your children or the Prophet ﷺ. Who would you sacrifice? The Islamic love tells you to sacrifice your children. And this is an indication that you are a true believer. So following the Sunnah, giving priority to whatever he says and accepting it, all of this is part of your belief in the declaration. Now, you will find a lot of um, evidences from the Quran, from the Sunnah in this first chapter. You can go through it. I, I don't think that we need to uh, read it because you will get the time, inshallah, to read it and maybe answer some questions on that. How important is this declaration of Tawheed? It is extremely important because this is your gate pass to paradise. Without it, you cannot enter paradise. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, إِنَّهُ لَيَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا نَفْسٌ مُؤْمِنَةً That no one, no soul, shall enter paradise except a believing soul. So you have to be a Muslim. And this is why whoever concludes life on earth with saying the statement, he will be admitted to Jannah. Whoever bears witness that there is no uh, 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 deity other than Allah worthy of, be worthy of being worshipped and that Muhammad is a servant and messenger of Allah, this will prevent fire of hell from touching him, as in the authentic hadith. Of course, this is just a summary, a glimpse. But the Shahada, we can spend lectures after lecture, and there are so many publications and books just highlighting this beautiful Shahada, which we were told if it were to put to be put in a scale and in the other scale you have the heavens and the earth the scale of the shahada of the declaration would overweigh it because of how powerful it is the second pillar of islam is a salat prayer and we know that prayer 
is the most important pillar after the declaration of Islam. Why? It is so important that it was the only thing that was revealed in the seventh heaven. While all other teachings of Islam were revealed on earth. Not only that. Everything was given to our Prophet والسلام, through the Archangel Jibreel, peace be upon him, except the prayer. It was given directly by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to our Prophet Muhammad والسلام, in the seventh heaven. Scholars agree that whoever prays it is a believer. Who, whoever is lazy to perform it is a hypocrite and whoever abandons it totally is a kafir apostate and a disbeliever now there are five daily prayers composed of 17 raka these are the pillars or these are the pillar of Islam, which is the prayer. When we say establishing prayer, we talk about these 17 rakahs. The emphatic sunnah before or after, these are voluntary. Witter, voluntary. Whatever you, duha, it's voluntary. If you don't pray anything except these 17 rakahs, you're a Muslim. The more you do, the better you are. But this is what Allah ordered you to do now what is the ruling on those who do not pray i don't know if we're going to talk to this to talk about this later on but if you look at the verses of the quran such as that in surah at-tawbah or in surah al-muddathir or elsewhere and combine to it the different narrations of the prophetic, prophetic sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. You will find that we have a theoretical and a practical ruling. So the theoretical ruling is anyone who does not pray is a kafir. And this is established through the Quran as well as the sunnah. The Theoretical ruling means that I do not implement it on an individual. What does that mean? I do not come to a person and I say, uh, do you pray? He says, no, I don't pray. So I say, okay, one plus one equals two. A person who doesn't pray is a kafir and this individual does not pray. Is, uh, uh, this individual does not pray then this equals he is a kafir. And this is totally wrong. Because in order to implement this practically, there are conditions to be fulfilled and there are obstacles to be eliminated. Without implementing this, we cannot say that an individual is a kafir. And this is why a lot of the sisters come to me and say, Sheikh, my husband abuses me, he batters me, he insults me, he doesn't provide for me. And I say, yani, you have to weigh the consequences, weigh the pros and cons, because I don't want you to become um, angry or regretful after asking divorce. You have to be patient. I'll give him da'wah. So she, because she wants out of the marriage, she says, and he doesn't pray. So when I hear this and say, oh, what do you mean by he doesn't pray? He doesn't pray at all. She wants me to conclude that, oh, if he doesn't pray, then he's a kafir. Then your marriage is void by default. People come to me and say, my father, he doesn't pray, not a single prayer. And I follow the opinion that whoever does not pray is a kafir. So he died. What should I do with the wealth he left? Because I will not in inherit him. All of this is wrong. 
the default that that individual is a Muslim. He claims to be a Muslim. He says he's a Muslim. All those around him acknowledge that he's a Muslim. The problem is, if you want to get him out of the fold of Islam, this is not for you and me. You have to fulfill the conditions that he's willing, that he's knowledgeable, that he's not misinterpreting, that he's not confused of the ruling, because that he's not forced, for example. All of these conditions and obstacles must be eliminated and fulfilled at the same time. For the conditions and eliminate it for the obstacles. And this is usually done by a panel of judges who would sit with the individual and say, Akhi, you don't pray. Say, yeah, yeah, I don't pray. I believe it's mandatory, but I don't pray. No, you have to pray because this is mandatory. Allah obliged you to pray, blah, blah, blah. He says, I understand, but I'm not going to pray. Uh, now you're talking to a panel of judges. They say, put him in jail for three days. So, every day, come and pray. He said, no, I believe in the obligation of prayer, but I don't want to pray. For three days, he's given a chance to show remorse and pray. Yet, he's arrogant and he is insisting not to pray. Scholars say, such an individual is not a Muslim anymore and he is to be executed and his execution is not uh, a prescribed punishment rather it is for his apostasy and he's treated as an, apost an apostate and he does not uh, uh, receive the funeral rites of a Muslim he's not washed, shrouded um, buried in a Muslim cemetery at all. So this is something that we have to acknowledge and understand before um, going into what, as they say, shooting from the hip. Anyone that doesn't pray, we just simply say, Khalas, he's a kafir, and we take him out of the millah of Islam. We will go into details, of course, about Salat, etc. But, yani, inshallah, this is just um, a preview. The third pillar of Islam is a zakat. A zakat is mostly associated with prayer in the verses of the Quran. Aqamu salata wa atu zakat. Always you will find them combined or joined usually and zakat is defined linguistically and technically like most of the forms of worship and salat for example linguistically it is dua and technically it it is specific movements and rhetorics at specific times inaugurated by takbiratul ihram and concluded by as-salam so when we come to zakat it's the same thing zakat linguistically is growth and increase and it also relates to purity and cleansing and good behavior. Now, paying zakat without a doubt cleanses your record book from sins. It erases it. Not only that, it cleanses your soul. And this is why Allah ordered Muhammad alayhi salatu so our prophet to take zakat from them, to take charity, to purify them with it. So when you give, it purifies your soul. When you give the poor and the needy, it purifies your soul and it also purifies you from different types of sins. And zakat 
is defined technically as a duty paid by certain individuals over a specific amount which is the threshold on specific categories such as gold silver uh, cash things that grow up from the earth crops that is uh, cattle livestock and merchandise that is for sale providing that the time circulation has taken place which is known as al hawl and we will come to talk about this inshallah in the future if allah is willing now this zakat is not given randomly it must be given to a specific category one out of eight mentioned in ayah number 60 in chapter number 9 surah at tawbah these eight categories are the only recipients of zakat money zakat is allah's right in our wealth so when salat is required to be performed by an individual who is sane, who's reached the age of, ad, uh, of puberty, who's accountable, zakat is unlike that. Even if an individual is insane, or we have an orphan, six years old, five years old, who has inherited a million, we must take zakat from this wealth though the owner is not accountable and this is the most authentic opinion because it is Allah's right in that wealth and there are so many yeah, any other um, rulings on that the fourth pillar of Islam is fasting in Arabic, fasting is to refrain. So, you can refrain from speaking, you can refrain from major sins, you can refrain from eating and drinking. This is all linguistically called fasting. In the technical term, fasting is to abstain, to refrain from anything that nullifies your fasting of the things that we will come to list insha'Allah from dawn till sunset with the intention of worshipping Allah and this is a very important addition because you can refrain from eating and drinking from the break of dawn till sunset because you're dieting because you are testing yourself because you don't feel like eating but this is not considered to be Islamic fasting. Islamic fasting has to be accompanied by the intention, which is to worship Allah the Almighty. Now, uh, fasting the days of the month of Ramadan is the pillar we're talking about. So, when we say about the fourth pillar of Islam is fasting, we don't mean fasting Mondays and Thursdays. This is emphatic sunnah. We don't refer to fasting the three white days or Arafah or Muzdalifa. These are all voluntary fasting. We only mean about fasting the month of Ramadan. This is what the Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam to one of his companions who came and asked him about it, he said to fast the month of Ramadan. And the companions wanted emphasis and to be sure. And he said, nothing else? And the Prophet said, nothing else. 
except if you want to volunteer. So this is what is a pillar of Islam. Zakat, which was previously mentioned, is different than charity. You're obliged to give 2.5% of your savings of cash, gold, or silver if they reach the threshold and a whole lunar year passes. But you can give more as charity, not as zakat. And the sky is the limit. So no one talks about charity and says that this is mandatory. No. What is mandatory, what is a pillar, is zakat. The percentage, 2.5%, can be 5%, can be 10%, depending on the thing that we are giving zakat over. And we will come to discuss this, inshallah, later on. So the fasting of Ramadan is one of the pillars of Islam. You miss it because you're sick or because you're traveling or a woman has a monthly period or you are old and unable. All of this would be looked into inshallah later on. The final pillar is Hajj, which is known as pilgrimage. And linguistically, pilgrimage is, in Arabic, Al-Qasd, which is setting off for a, def uh, uh, a definite um, destination. Technically, it is traveling to Mecca to perform this ritual according to the particular manner at a specific time and under specific conditions. And Hajj is mandated once in a lifetime. So every Muslim who's capable physically and financially and has no barriers to prevent him from performing Hajj, must perform it once in a lifetime. And there are conditions and there are ways and there are things that are related to this. A woman without a mahram cannot perform Hajj and it's not mandated upon her until she is able uh, to find a mahram. Allah says pilgrimage to his house is a duty owed to Allah by all people who are able to undertake it. So it is a, 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 an obligation upon people. And also the Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam in the hadith of Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him and with his father, Islam has been built on five pillars. One, testifying that there is no deity worthy of being worshipped but Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. Two, performing the prayers. Three, praying the zakat. Four, making the pilgrimage to the house. Five, and fasting in Ramadan. And this was narrated by Bukhari and uh, reported by Bukhari and Muslim. Therefore, these are the five pillars of Islam, which each and every Muslim on earth most likely know them by heart and most likely try their level best to abide by them as they are the basics of Islam. Then we elevate to the higher level which is Iman and its six pillars. Then we elevate to Al-Ihsan but the bare minimum that would help us identify an individual as a Muslim is to commit to these five pillars of Islam. So this is 
today's material, I have no idea if I can check your questions or not, but let me give it a shot, inshallah Azza wa Jal. As I'm filming this from my iPhone, and here we go, 18 comments. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, and uh, don't uh, no, this is not it. Here we go, eighteen. Okay, this line live. How to see the comments? It's something I still have to find. So we have Um Rayyan here. The question is on my iPhone. If I want to go for Hajj and Alhamdulillah have money, time and health, but my mahram does not uh okay. I can't see the rest. Give me a second. Wallahi, I apologize, but because I am from the era of dinosaurs, I'm unable to find means to see the questions. So on my iPad, I'm unable to do that. Islamic No can do. So uh, I think we will wrap it up here uh, and hopefully the administration would try to explain this to me uh, later on so that we can uh, do that later. Uh, as planned, if I am going to continue with this program, uh, hopefully Monday and Thursday, same time, Next Monday, it will be Q&A, which will be uh, picked from the link that the administration should have, inshallah, and they will send it to me Sunday night. So Monday, same time, 4.30 Mecca time till 5.30, I will be answering your questions. And every Thursday, with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal, we will try uh, to do it here, uh, inshallah Azza wa Jal from the book and we will try to go through um, the rulings of fiqh uh, from beginning to end. So until I meet you next time, I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.